continuous glucose monitoring, how it assists patient care in diabetes. Continuous glucose monitoring and uh, AGP are novel technologies in diabetes landscape that help in getting a comprehensive view of changing glucose profile and optimizing our decision-making process. They empower patients to better informed treatment decisions. Even though they are fully actionable data, apart from the cost, issues of accuracy, especially during the episodes of nocturnal hypoglycemia, and some concern regarding the overestimation of the hypoglycemic episodes are still a concern with these new technologies. The speaker is uh, Dr. Joni Jos Kandambilli, Senior Consultant Diabetologist from Kochi. Uh, well, good evening to all of you. Thank you, Chairpersons. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate uh, good, my good friend Jyoti and his wife Sunita and the team, Arun, Gobiga, everyone, for organizing such a great event every year and bringing awareness in the diabetes management. The topic given to me today is on continuous glucose monitoring and its benefits in clinical practice. So the flow of my presentation is going to be changing phase of diabetes and its impact, glycemic variability and its relevance in this continuous glucose monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring itself, ampullately glucose profile and the conclusion. So the changing phase of diabetes. This is a person who is 84 years old now, who had diabetes by the age of 63 and had series of small events like CABG, neuropathy at the age of 78 and he's still at 84 without much complications. That was the diabetes about 30, 40 years back. Diabetes used to come by the age of 60s and if you don't really understand why today I call it the changing phase of diabetes because the term called dysglycemia. Dysglycemia is the glucose fluctuations beyond the normal glucose homeostasis, which I'll be speaking in the next couple of slides. So if this dysglycemia is there for a period of 15 to 20 years, then it starts affecting your organs, causing the diabetic complications, which is the dreaded complication of diabetes. Diabetes per se is, was not a big problem in the olden days. People used to get diabetes and never nobody bothered much of diabetes. But today that is not the scenario. We are seeing the complications of diabetes. And that is the danger part of diabetes. In terms of the disease itself, in terms of the cost which you have to manage and the threat to the life itself. So if you look at these two individuals, these are all life scenarios which we are seeing now in our daily practice. I am showing two other individuals. One at the age of 33, he had diabetes. And many a times these patients who get diabetes at the age of 33, my previous speakers now are saying that we are seeing diabetes by the age of 20, 16, 18, etc. Type 2 diabetes. And this person, when you get diabetes at a younger age, you tend to be a little lenient and a little casual about it because diabetes is silent at the first 10 to 15 years. That's why it's called the silent killer. The first 15 years it is silent and then only the dysglycemia causes the complications after the next 15 years. So by the age of 43, she, he had angioplasty. At 46, he had neuropathy. At 50, he had multiple toe amputations. And by 53, he died due to cardiac arrest. The similar with the next patient, she had diabetes due to gestational diabetes, went on to become frank diabetes. She also kept uh, dealt it very casually because diabetes is silent without much problems. And dysglycemia led because of not tight glycemic control within the normal glucose homeostasis and led to various complications like diabetic foot and she is now on dialysis at the age of 45 and her one
one leg is amputated because of severe charcoal foot and severe foot infection. So, my dear friends, diabetes is increasing in large numbers. We all know that every conference, everybody talks about it. And diabetes is coming in large numbers in young people that also now everybody is talking about. But one thing which we all forget is this. That is, a tsunami of complications is going to come in the coming years. Younger and younger people are going to succumb to these dreaded complications of diabetes. The retinopathy, the blindness, the kidney failure, the nephropathy, the foot amputations, etc. is going to cause a huge burden to the society, to the family, and it's going to create a fear among the people. This is a paper which came, which said type 2 diabetes in youth is a bad disease and a big challenge. And it says in this paper that in young, it's type 2 diabetes in young is a bad phenotype, is a lethal phenotype that mentions, it's a lethal phenotype, which causes the complications at a younger age and takes away the people at a very young age. And a good number of people will not cross the age of 60s. My previous other speaker, especially Dr. Sadikot, was uh, president of IDF, was speaking about this. A good number of people will not cross the age of 60s in the coming years. If a very important uh, aspect of treatment we don't change. We can't go by the old ways of diabetes management. There was a treatment diabetes, treatment of diabetes was very casual. Once in a while, patient goes to the doctor, just manages the fasting sugars or postprandial sugars. And even if the sugars are not very well controlled, if you get diabetes by the age of 65, you really didn't see much of these complications in the olden days. And more than that, lifestyle has taken a large change. We are not active as before. We are eating more and more of unhealthy food. And all these have contributed to this dysglycemia causing more and more dreaded complications at a younger age. And yes, my dear friends, with this introduction, I am now going to speak of the importance of continuous glucose monitoring. So I want to emphasize that with this younger and younger people coming to you with diabetes, with younger and younger people getting complications, I think we need to think, sit back and think, uh, can we go by the old ways of treatment or we, do we need to change the ways we manage diabetes because we need to make sure that our people live longer with less complications. So, so studies have shown that diabetic patients overall stay 29% of the day in hyperglycemic rage. Even in those in well control with on, on oral drugs, PPG values exceeded more than 140 after 57% of the meals. You are all well aware that as PPG values increases, the risk of coronary artery disease and mortality increases. This is what I wanted to speak of. Once you understand this logic, then you understand why the importance of continuous glucose monitoring is. This is the normal glucose homeostasis. God is a beautiful creator. He created a beautiful pancreas with islet cells with insulins. Whatever you eat, how much ever you eat, your sugar will not cross 140 when, before diabetes. That's the beauty of the creation. And even if you don't eat with the counter-regulatory hormones, the sugars don't fall below 70. And that's the beauty of the creator. But once you get diabetes, the, this glucose homeostasis goes haywire and the sugars fluctuate beyond the normal glucose homeostasis. And this is what happens. And once this happens, studies have now clearly shows, shown that it triggers various pathways causing endothelial damage, oxidative stress, etc. And that's because in the euglycemic state in the mitochondria, it is ATP production which happens. But once it, there is hypoglyce, hyperglycemia, it is superoxidase production which triggers the cascade of events. 
and I don't want to go into these details, but studies have shown simple things like increase sorbitol productions, increase inositol productions, which triggers these cascade of events leading to all uh, vascular complications, especially in the myelin sheath in the nerves, it gets damaged leading to neuropathy, etc. So this is the way it cascades of events happens and till now we never in the olden days, we never needed to bother about these events and these fluctuations because as I said, the dysglycemia takes about 15 to 20 years normally in an average thing to get affected to a problematic phase of micro, microvascular, especially microvascular complications. So when you get diabetes at a younger age, you have a longer period of time to get into these problems. And so, the danger is much higher in younger people. There are studies which have shown that the higher the fluctuations, more the cell apoptosis and other cell, uh, cell dysfunctions and cell deaths happens. So that is the importance. The importance of glycemic variability has to be understood. And we need to tackle this glycemic variability or dysglycemia otherwise known as. This is a, a, a marker of oxidative stress. That is the urinary 8 isomer of PGF2 is a marker of oxidative stress or endothelial damage, which have clearly shown us there's a linear correlation between the glycemic variability or the dysglycemia and, the, and this marker, which shows that oxidative stress happens when there is glycemic variability. And there are, this is a study which showed that at three different groups of patients who had different levels of glycemic variability, the mortality was higher with higher, higher variability, glycemic variability or dysglycemia. Again, studies have shown that the cardiovascular risk increases as glycemic variability increases. Again, studies have shown, I'm not going into the study details because of the lack of time, so, these studies have clearly shown that even the hospitalization increases where there is this glycemia or glycemic variability were higher, was higher. Another point is, many a times we wonder why these patients have memory problems. Many a times this is a problem in clinical practice as patients go, uh, patients' diabetes worsens. They tend to forget, they tend to forget whether they've taken the injections in the morning and they, they repeatedly take the injections or even take double dosing of tablets causing hypoglycemias. The cognitive impairment happens over a period of time and there is a link between glycemic, dysglycemia or glycemic variability with cognitive impairment. This is a, a, a arm which showed that, a study which showed that the dysglycemia has different arms. The, the, the flasting blood sugar arm, the postprandial blood sugar arm and the glycemic fluctuations. If all these arms are high, then the complication rates are higher. The moment you bring down all these arms, the complication rates come down. Now you, you are now dealing with diabetes with HbA1c and many a times you think that's sufficient. But let me tell you and I, my previous speakers, some of them also had uh, said about it that HbA1c is only an average. It doesn't tell you the fluctuations. So I think till now we were managing pretty well with HbA1c but I think it's time that we have now changed one step ahead especially in younger individuals that we need to make sure that this dysglycemia is also taken care of. So in that context, now a new concept has come. That is the good HbA1c and the bad HbA1c. Now you may have severe fluctuating blood sugars and still get a 7 HbA1c because the average is coming to 7. But there is a severe dysglycemia. Whereas in this case, you can see there is a good within the normal home, home, glucose homeostasis and that is why the HbA1c is 7 and that is good which will not cause the triggering of cascade of events. So, my dear friends, 
with that understanding now what is this gly uh, continuous glucose monitoring device helps us and in doing it first of all it helps us to assess this this glycemia in patients and the glycemic variability to, to, to show you an example you have a patient here with fasting near normal, postprandial near normal and an HbA1c near normal. And in this patient, he was developing complications in spite of near normal glu uh, sugars and HbA1c. Then we thought that maybe there is dysglycemia happening. And then we did a continuous glucose monitoring. The first device which came up which by the Medtronics that was a iPro. Uh, IPRO3 and then you can see it was it was out of the normal glucose homeostasis so it, it helps us detect the dysglycemia in patients whom you think the complications are worsening again another patient whose sugars are reasonably controlled HB1C also reasonably controlled again the microalbumin was worsening and then we did the IPRO and you can see the wide fluctuation now that is what I said, HbA1c can sometimes give you a wrong reading. It can give you a wrong feeling of happiness that you're doing well to your patient. But it, it's just an average, sometimes it may be wrong. Now the second benefit of doing a continuous glucose monitoring is that it helps in thera therapeutic decisions. Now here you have a patient, again fasting is uh, 84, postprandial is controlled, HbA1c is 7.4. Now we know now in young patients, we now need to achieve as tight as possible without causing hypoglycemia to get the good uh, normal glucose homeostasis. And here you can see he's on amaryl and citapin, the normal glucose and the normal doses of medicine. And normally what we are now doing is just blindly increasing and decreasing doses, hoping that he doesn't go into hypoglycemias. If he goes into hypoglycemia, he will go to another doctor or he may himself stop some of the medicines. So if we are able to do the uh, continuous glucose monitoring, we really know what is the pathological problem there, where the problem is happening and then target that problem and then get good glycemic control without causing much hypoglycemia and in this case you can see it is almost within the glucose homeostasis but it's only the just postprandial which was problem and then we educated on the good good postprandial control of food as well as we added a PPG that is uh, uh, voglibose and uh, three times just added that and then you can see in three months the HbA1c dropped to 6.4 from 7.4 and without causing hypoglycemia. So that is you are now having much clear picture of what is the in inside problem of the patient and treat to the target, treat to the problem and get tighter control without causing hypoglycemia in your patients. So this is another patient, a father, a priest, who had severe uncontrolled diabetes, HbA1c 10.6, long, went to different doct doctors in hospitals, uncontrolled with various types of treatments. Finally, when he came to us, he was mixed at 40 and 25, and we told him that we need to do a continuous glucose monitoring and see what's happening, and see the highly fluctuating blood sugars. And we told him either you need to go to a multiple daily in insulin injections, or go for an insulin pump, and he preferred to go for a mu multiple daily injections. And we put him on Nova Rapid at that time, three times, and Levimer at, at night time and see the blood sugar control. That green column is the normal glucose homeostasis and we brought excellent control to normal glucose homeostasis. Not much of severe hypoglycemia, minor changes in the doses and we got very good control. So that's the third benefit of uh, the uh, thing. And the next benefit is it helps us in detecting hypoglycemic unawareness. Many a times after we started doing this, we realized many of the patients, we are missing unawareness of hypoglycemia. Many a patients are going through hypoglycemic unawareness, which patients also don't know, you also don't know if this is happening in our patients. And many a times it's risky. 
especially in patients who are older, especially who have coronary problems, this is a risky situation. And many a times we see patients uh, having coronary artery events happening in our patients and dying of coronary artery disease. And many a times it is because of this undetected unawareness of hypoglycemia. Here is a study which showed that unrecognized episodes of uh, hypoglycemias uh, by, uh, recognized by CGMS and, th and in this study it showed that 63% of the patients with type 1 diabetes had unrecognized hypoglycemias and 47% of the patients had in type 2 diabetes and out of these 74% had this uh, unawareness hypoglycemias uh, at night time, which is even more dangerous. Again, another benefit of continuous glucose monitoring is it helps us to achieve higher number of patients reach HbA1c targets. You all know very well that all studies around the world clearly shows that only around 45 to 50 percent of the patients reach HbA1c targets. The rest of the 50 persons goes around not getting under control in spite of our conventional treatments. So we did, we did take up a study and this study was published, uh, presented at the uh, um, ATTD conference at London and this is one of its kind, one of the early studies I had a larger group which is gone but this is a paper at that time I have not updated. Now here we had only 25 patients at that time this was a study, a pilot study. What we did was we took patients who were not getting control, we were not reaching HbA1c targets on, unconvention, on conventional treatment and we put them on CGMS and then changed the treatment according to the problem which was found in the continuous glucose monitoring and then we uh, called them back for an H, uh, seven point ch charting and we also adjusted after that and then after three months we uh, did uh, HbA1c and we found that I'm not going into the study details 60% uh, to 70% of these group of patients HB reached HbA1c targets so finally the study outcome you can see 60% reached to the target of HbA1c which were not getting controlled with conventional treatment because either you increase the dose patient goes into hypoglycemia you reduce the dose patient goes into hyperglycemia so various treatment modalities were either added the OHAs, MDIs or insulin pumps etc. Now finally the study concluded that once you do this continuous glucose monitoring we were able to increase the number of patients who achieve targets in our clinics about 60 to 80 percent of the patients reached the targets. We saw higher and higher number of patients continuously reaching targets and keeping those targets because of training into lifestyle modification as well. So then came the newer gadgets after the IPRO from the Metronics, the newer version by the Abbott came that is the ambulatory glucose profile monitoring and this is how it is. The benefit is it's got 14 day monitoring, there is no need of calibration. And I'm not going into the details of this because of the lack of time, but I'm just going to give you. This is a, a software which is added to the same program. This was uh, developed by the International Institute of Diabetes uh, from Minneapolis. And this was taken, uh, pa the patent was ta uh, taken by this company and used for this product. And this collates the 14 day average of sugars and gives you into a graph which will tell us on one glimpse what the problem is. We can also do individual day study as well as we can do a 14 day average collation study. So there is a median graph that's the sender graph and then there's a 25 and 75 percentile graph that's the thick, uh, the darker blue graph and the lighter blue is the 10th and 90th percentile graph. How many more minutes? 20. 20 seconds oh so I have less time so I'm not going to the details but this median tells us the 50th point of the average of sugars at that particular time and then this 25 personnel is 
25% from above and 25% below values are removed and and the and the median range is given so we know where the fluctuations are and then the outer range whether the variability is higher the 10th and 90th percentile so this if the wider the graph that means the the variability is much higher so you have i'm just going so with this graph we we are able to it stop it won't go further so you can conclude it's, it's over okay so i think this is also helpful in one more point which i wanted to finish off with i think the uh, talk is over that it also helps in continue in advising lifestyle corrections with this graph we also ask them to do a food chart and bring so i, I think we will uh, just wind up with just one more important message that is uh, so this will tell us that whether it is going into hypoglycemia the if the meat, the the bottom line is going towards the hypoglycemia shows the risk of hypoglycemia again this tells us it is within the range but at night time you can see it is showing a dip so it tells us at that point of time we should be careful either dose reduction has to be done so continuous glucose monitoring also helps in lifestyle education and modification here i just want to show you an example a patient with 9.8 hba1c and he was on ins insulin about 15 and 15 and istavel was the medicine he was on and you can see this is the daily graph and we just educated on carbohydrate corrections reducing the carbohydrates increasing the vegetables reducing the excessive snackings all that we educated with the graph and see the difference within the next 3 months without much increasing the medications itself just an increase in two two doses uh, two unit dose 18 and 18 the hb on c dropped to 6% so it helps in various aspects in the in our clinical practice so to conclude my dear friends glycemic variability of dysglycemia is an important risk factor in patients with type 2 diabetes especially in young patients recent ev evidence suggests glycemic variability may play an important role in the occurrence and development of complications in diabetes cgm helps in detecting this dysglycemia or dis or glycemic variability cgm enables more physiological accurate treatment to individualize therapy in individual patients cgm helps to identify problems in the management and quickly arrive at treatment decisions and modifications helps to detect hypoglycemic unawareness very important many a times it's going unnoticed after we started doing it we realized that and which can reduce the morbidity and mortality helps in lifestyle education and modification and thereby reduce the drug burden and also finally and most important it helps us achieve higher number of patients reach glycemic goals with lower incidence of hypoglycemia thank you very much for your patient hearing thank you dr joni for excellent presentation please be seated even after the control of diabetes with hb on c within leads the role of uh, cgm is still there there are a lot of variants for the cgm monitoring so the application of the cgm in uh, rural settings or oh, the uh, the settings where the cgm monitoring is impossible can you suggest any mode of uh, application of the cgm in that area too you want to to talk on rural area and where people cannot afford it yeah. i think uh, the poor man's cgm is seven point testing because i didn't have time i had to cover so much i couldn't cover that seven point testing is something which all of us should uh, advocate in our practice which is very important one of the previous speakers clearly showed the benefit of smbg in practice and improvement in complications and reducing mortality so a poor man cgm is seven point testing however uh, i think in all our patients i 
I recommend a seven point testing. I'm sure that all of you know about seven point CGM, uh, SMBG testing. Uh, the seven point testing, I ask every patient to bring once in three months when they come to us and correlate with the results. But what we have found is seven point testing is not equivalent to a CGM. There, were, there may be very many peaks and troughs which we may be missing with the seven point testing. But patients who cannot afford, definitely at least please do a seven point testing. Uh, well, both are good enough. The benefit of uh, Abbott is the recent one. I'm sure the Metron, it is a modified or a improved version from the Metronics because uh, it has got 14 days whereas the Metronics has got 7 days. So we have got, so let me tell you, I think the benefit of a 14 days, every fourth day if you call the patient and if you can uh, see the graph and do treatment changes, it, it's very, very beneficial. What we do is that. So in three or four sittings, you get excellent results. That's one thing. Second thing is you don't need calibration. The technology is there where it is self-calibrated. So these are the benefits of, uh, and it's mo more patient friendly. So that way it's good, but uh, accuracy wise, both are good and both are beneficial.